the Malaria Initiative, PMI, both started under President George W. Bush, and other initiatives against other infectious and neglected tropical diseases. Effective use of funds is essential to maximize care for the world's neediest people. Countries with strong health institutions and sound public health practices responded quickly to and recovered more rapidly from the COVID-19 pandemic. This demonstrates the importance of localization, by which USAID helps governments and the private sector in developing countries to strengthen their own ability to address needed training, services, accountability, and organizational capacity. Unfortunately, many USAID-funded global health activities remain rooted in patterns that began decades ago and measure improvements in terms of inputs money spent instead of outcomes achieved. From the 1950s to 1970s, the major recognized threats to human health were infectious diseases such as polio and smallpox, and USAID-funded programs in a country, not with a country. Maternal and child health, food, water, and sanitation programs were often intermittent. USAID consistently financed population control, contraception, and abortion as essential to development. Most programs focused on one disease or condition but had little integration with other global health activities. Chronic diseases were ignored. Consequently, the next conservative administration should focus on updating the Global Health Bureau's portfolio, emphasizing a comprehensive approach to supporting women, children, and families, building host country institutional capacity, increasing awards to local and faith-based partners, expanding what occurred during the Trump administration with the NPI, and improving USAID's ability to coordinate with local partners. Updating Funding Priorities The Bureau should identify and eliminate outdated and ineffective concepts and focus on funding innovation. A rigorous review is necessary to ensure that current programs and funding streams avoid wasting taxpayer dollars and prioritize what is needed now and what works. Focusing on holistic health care and support for women, children, and families. The continued high rate of maternal and infant mortality is a persistent global tragedy. Contrary to current publicity, this problem is not solved by abortion. Families genuinely cherish children. The next leadership at USAID must focus attention on women and children's health, including unborn children, as well as health risks across lifespans, including childhood infections, cervical cancer, adolescent risks, and family stability, by utilizing a coordinated approach. The Bureau should implement a request for application for resilient families that harvests collaborative funds from siloed programs and makes individuals and the family, not diseases, or conditions, the true focus of intervention. Increasing USAID collaboration with faith-based organizations. FBOs historically have been much more successful in outreach to remote and vulnerable populations, based on trust built through decades of service. The value of collaborating with FBOs was demonstrated in the October 2020 Evidence Summit on Religious Engagement. In Sub-Saharan Africa, FBOs often provide more than 80% of health care, especially to the extremely poor. In contrast, the Global Health Bureau historically has provided 85% of its funding to large U.S. NGOs with significant overhead costs, as a result of which only 20% 30% of funding reaches people in need. Point 15. Leveraging the strength and experience of presidential initiatives. Millions of people are alive today because of the American people's investment in PEPFAR and PMI. The training, laboratory, clinical intervention, health education data collection, and organizational platforms of these programs became the bedrock for responding to the COVID pandemic. It is time for these programs to become part of an integrated, strong, and sustainable network of healthcare and public health in developing countries. A smooth transition to national ownership and funding, however, will require better coordination of USAID's own stovepipe programs with PEPFAR and PMI. Strengthening the collection and use of data. Good decisions are based on accurate data. For decades, global health programs have relied mostly on statistical modeling, rather than actual data, or survey data, the weakest type of data. Poor data quality undermines both the evaluation and improvement of desired outcomes achieved by our global health programs. The Trump administration implemented critical updates of PEPFAR systems for the collection and reporting of data to increase transparency and hold funded partners and overseas missions accountable. The next conservative administration should apply these reforms to all of USAID's global health programs. Strengthening private sector engagement. The Bureau's Center for Innovation. and Impact. CII, should be empowered to expand networks of private and faith-based health organizations that can develop projects using development, impact bonds, capital funds, and innovative technologies, including with the Millennium Challenge Corporation and the new U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. More flexible and agile CII funding will spur innovation within the Bureau and help to enhance countries' self-reliance in the provision of health care. Improving Bureau hiring, staffing, and recruitment practices. The Global Health Bureau should address its own management challenges by modifying the high ratio of contractors to direct hires, holding career leadership accountable for effective management, and building more flexibility in emergency responses. Bureau personnel suffer from mission drift, burnout, and a lack of vision. 
new directives, social agendas, and extra layers of review have obscured core activities and caused talent to leave the agency. Conservative leadership must return the focus to development and improved workforce morale and focus on global outcomes. And the efficient use of taxpayer dollars. Holding the UN, the World Health Organization, WHO, and other multilateral organizations accountable. Leadership should designate a political appointee to help coordinate cross-agency efforts to hold the U.S. government's multilateral partners, UN and WHO agencies and other international organizations to a higher level of financial and programmatic accountability, including assurances that language promoting abortion will be removed from UN documents, policy statements, and technical literature. The United States must have more prominent representation in international technical committees and regulation, setting organizations to ensure the proper execution of American resources, the preservation of our values, the protection of innovation, and the vitality of our biomedical sector. Global Humanitarian Assistance The U.S. government is the world's largest humanitarian actor, annually dispersing billions of dollars in life-saving assistance food, water, shelter, emergency health care, and related protection support to tens of millions of vulnerable people. Funded by the U.S. Congress through the International Disaster Assistance, IDA, account, USAID pays for nearly half of the budget of the Nobel Prize-winning UN World Food Program, WFP, as well as dozens of simultaneous operations that range from responses to hurricanes in Central America to tackling outbreaks of Ebola in Central Africa and caring for millions of people displaced by ongoing conflicts. USAID's emergency responses once were focused primarily on natural cataclysms, such as hurricanes, floods, and earthquakes. Today, the agency spends more than 80% of its humanitarian budget on chronic man-made crises. Most of these emergency responses began years ago and absorb billions of dollars annually. With no end in sight. Every year sees financial demands grow in response to new conflicts, most recently Ukraine. The budget of the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, BHA, has doubled compared to just a few years ago, and BHA can no longer manage its funds responsibly. A politically powerful foreign aid industry that benefits financially from extending and expanding these large-scale programs for years, even decades, ensures little scrutiny of these ever-increasing appropriations. The massive growth in emergency aid distorts humanitarian responses, worsens corruption in the countries we support, and exacerbates the misery of those we intend to help. The permanence of this assistance, particularly in countries where we have little to no in-country presence and must rely on UN agencies to self-monitor, has morphed into a CO governance scheme in which the US government effectively finances the social services obligations of corrupt regimes that threaten the United States. These governments can then redirect scarce budget resources away from costly health and education toward financing their wars, supporting terrorism, repressing their citizens, and enriching themselves. Examples of this abuse are spread throughout the world. L over the past decade, the U.S. government has expended $14 billion in aid to Syria where the bloody regime of Bashar al-Assad a close ally of Iran and Russia schemes nearly half of foreign aid through inflated official exchange rates, the diversion of food baskets to its military units, and procurement arrangements with compromised local contractors. El Yemen, once the breadbasket of the Arabian Peninsula, is now dependent on billions of dollars of aid as formerly productive Yemeni farmers cannot compete against free food while irrigation systems remain in disrepair, leaving the country to suffer from water shortages during long summer droughts and flooding during its rainy season. Iran-backed healthy rebels divert substantial amounts of aid to support their war efforts. L in Afghanistan, the aid infrastructure built over 20 years of American military presence that three presidents wanted to end collapsed with the failure of U.S. trained Afghan forces to repel the Taliban's 2021 advances. Yet the country has received nearly $1 billion more in U.S. humanitarian aid since the Taliban's takeover and absent a U.S. embassy to ensure that it is not diverted to the Taliban and other terrorist groups. L in Burma U.S. aid finances all of the food and medical care for hundreds of thousands of persecuted Rohingya that the military regime forces to live in open-air concentration camps. L. In northern Iraq, hundreds of thousands of Yazidis targeted for genocidal extermination by ISIS remain in miserable camps unable to return home because of the Iraqi government's refusal to clear out Iran-backed militias occupying their homeland. In effect, humanitarian aid is sustaining war economies, creating financial incentives for warring parties to continue fighting, discouraging governments from reforming, and propping up malign regimes. Nefarious actors reap billions of dollars in profits from diversions of our humanitarian assistance, but so do international organizations. The WFP charges 36% in overhead while Oxfam International's overhead has reached 70% in Yemen, reflecting the high costs of foreign staff, security, and logistics. With powerful lobbies in Washington, D.C. and in leadership positions throughout USAID and the Department of State, the aid industry adroitly exploits Congress's disposition to increase funding year on year to assist those in dire need but provides no evidence to justify the mounting budget requests. In 2020, 
USAID's leadership fused formerly bifurcated food and non-food emergency relief operations into a single bureau for humanitarian assistance to improve the management of the agency's largest portfolio, but this reform was not sufficient to address the problem. The next administration should resize and repurpose USAID's humanitarian aid portfolio to restore its original purpose of providing emergency short-term relief, prepare vulnerable communities for transition, and do no harm in the following ways. L. Work with Congress to make deep cuts in the IDA budget by ending programs that do more harm than good in places controlled by malign actors, such as in Yemen, Syria, and Afghanistan, where our aid is consumed by fraud, diversion, and partner overhead costs. L. Require USAID and the State Department to devise country-based exit strategies that term limit the duration of humanitarian responses and transition funding from emergency to development projects. This will require robust diplomacy to press host governments to integrate displaced persons in lieu of keeping them in expensive and dehumanizing camps financed by the international community. L. Transition from large awards to expensive, inefficient, and corrupt UN agencies, global NGOs, and contractors to local, especially faith-based, entities that are already operating on the ground. This approach provides a far less expensive and more effective alternative for aid delivery. Local partners more ably navigate corrupt environments and are more likely to steer vulnerable populations away from dependence on aid toward self-sufficiency. L. Require that BHA avail itself of existing IDA authorities that it fails to use, including to dispense with the cost reimbursement model that disqualifies. Undercapitalized local NGOs, accept other donor vetting of local partners, streamline the award approval process, and expand the use of fixed amount awards to rein in cost overruns. L. Direct USAID's Bureau for Management to hire more procurement officers for BHA to strengthen the Bureau's award management capacity and reduce the incentives to issue large awards to aid industry giants. L. Allow BHA to manage the process of hiring personal services contractors. L. Require BHA's partners to adopt stricter vetting procedures to prevent aid from being diverted to terrorists. L. Increase efforts to obtain greater contributions, not just pledges, for humanitarian operations from other donors and make this a condition for receiving additional U.S. aid. Leveraging foreign aid to unleash the power of America's private sector. During the 1960s, when USAID was launched, 80% of financial flows from the United States to the developing world was in the form of U.S. government assistance. Today, that figure is under 10%, overtaken by private investment, remittances, and private charities, all demonstrating the power of America's private sector to promote wealth generating economic development in poor countries. Leaders in the developing world routinely press U.S. officials about their preference for trade and investment, not aid. Instead, the Biden administration is leveraging private sector financing to promote its climate and other progressive agendas worldwide. The next conservative administration must return USAID to a foreign aid model that leverages its resources to promote private sector solutions to the world's true development problems and end the need for future foreign aid. Private capital investment in these markets is the greatest enabler of job creation and sustainable economic growth throughout the developing world. A key tool of American soft power leadership is the U.S. Development Finance Corporation, DFC. Launched in December 2019, DFC sought to unleash the power of America's private sector to advance our interests by providing emerging markets with blended financing opportunities to help end wretched poverty, create new markets for U.S. made products, strengthen bilateral partnerships in strategic parts of the world, and offset China's predatory loans and investments. The Trump administration launched a USAID DFC working group to maximize development outcomes and review individual investment projects through a counter China lens and ensure a cohesive interagency development response. As development agencies, USAID and DFC must do a better job of aligning their respective activities and closely integrate both structurally and operationally. The easiest way to foster this alignment is to dual hat the role of DFC's chief development officer so that he or she serves simultaneously in both institutions. Like all U.S. federal bodies, DFC should be restored to its original intent of deploying its commercial risk-reducing financial services instead of its current misuse as another global vehicle to promote economy-killing climate programs, meet irrelevant diversity objectives, and overfocus on low-impact or misguided gender-based activities. Branding A deeply embedded culture within the foreign aid bureaucracy views public recognition of U.S. assistance as secondary to a larger philanthropic mission and is embarrassed by the American flag. Citing vaguely defined security Concerns USAID's implementers UN agencies, international NGOs, and contractors often fail to credit the American people for the billions of dollars in assistance they provide the rest of the world even as they engage in self-promoting public relations to raise other donor funds. This approach has negative foreign policy implications as China relentlessly promotes its own selfing efforts to gain influence and resources. Worst of all, malign actors sometimes appropriate credit for unbranded U.S. assistance, healthy terrorists, for example, claim to provide for the people under their occupation with anonymous U.S. humanitarian aid. The United States is in a struggle for influence with China, Russia, and other competitors, and American generosity must not go unacknowledged. The next conservative administration should build on the Trump administration's branding policy, 
which revamped ADS Chapter 320, to force the aid bureaucracy to fully credit the American people for the aid they are providing. The senior advisor for brand management in the Bureau for Legislative and Public Affairs, LPA, discussed. Infra, should be a political appointee who is responsible for maximizing the visibility of U.S. assistance by enforcing branding policy on every grant, cooperative agreement, and contract. The LPA should liaise with counterparts at the U.S. Agency for Global Media, USM, to ensure local media pickup of these activities. Other offices and bureaus. Office of Administrator. The next conservative administration should leave in place the current structure of two presidentially appointed, Senate-confirmed deputy administrators, one for policy and one for management. The deputy administrators and the chief of staff must be individuals with extensive previous service in the executive branch, ideally at foreign affairs agencies, and be fluent in the language and practice of federal procurement. Bureau for Foreign Assistance As noted above, the next conservative administration should name the USAID Administrator as Director of Foreign Assistance, F, at the Department of State with the rank of Deputy Secretary. It should reorient the bulk of F staff from focusing on the formulation of the annual President's budget proposal to the execution of already appropriated resources. This should include eliminating the duplicative mission and bureau resource requests, speeding up the availability of appropriations by delivering to Congress within 60 days the report required by Section 653, a, of the Foreign Assistance Act, FAA, and fast-tracking the approval of congressional notifications, CNS, and other pre-obligation requirements. Management Bureau As indicated previously, the next conservative administration should name a political appointee as USAID's Senior Procurement Executive and Director of the Agency's Office of Acquisition and Assistance, m oaa Political appointees with the appropriate credentials, including warrants, should be placed within m oaa and the agency should exercise its authority to engage qualified experts from other federal departments and agencies and outside of government, if they are free of conflicts of interest, on the technical committees that review applications for USAID's contract and grant competitions. The administration should change the designation of USAID's competition advocate to an individual favorable to innovative types of contracts that can reduce the aid oligopoly's grip on the agency. Office of Human Capital and Talent Management As soon as possible after Inauguration Day, the next conservative administration should name a political appointee as USAID's Chief Human Capital Officer, CHCO, and Director of the Office of Human Capital and Talent Management. USAID's White House liaison must be an individual with substantial experience with federal personnel systems. The White House Office of Presidential Personnel should allow the USAID Administrator to explore with counterparts at the Office of Personnel Management whether the agency could hire personnel under both the administratively determined authority and Schedule C of the Accepted Service of the Federal Civil Service. USAID should be one of the agencies to pilot test a reinstated Executive Order 13957,16 which created a Schedule F within the accepted service, and should aggressively recruit and place candidates into term-limited positions under Schedule A of the accepted service, especially veterans. The new CHCO should examine how the existing members of the Senior Executive Service, SES, at USAID should be reworked throughout the agency and should institute an SES mobility program to encourage the regular rotation of senior career leaders, including through details to other departments and agencies. Bureau for Policy, Planning, and Learning The next conservative administration should shift the policy functions of the Bureau for Policy, Planning, and Learning, PPL, to the Office of Budget and Resource Management, BRM, located in the Office of the Administrator. It should rename BRM the Office of Budget, Policy, and Resource Management, BPRM, and staff the policy team with political appointees. The administration should also move the responsibility for reviewing and processing proposed changes in USAID's policy Bible. The Automated Directives System, adds, from the Management Bureau to the new BPRM. Even before these changes, the Assistant Administrator for PPL should decree an immediate freeze on changes in the ADS and agency-wide policy documents to allow for the priority publication of amendments to reflect the new administration's viewpoint. All major agency policies should be reviewed and amended or withdrawn within the new administration's first calendar year in office. Bureau for Legislative and Public Affairs The next Conservative Administration should invest no more than 10% of USAID's allocation of administratively determined politically appointed positions in the Bureau for Legislative and Public Affairs. A priority for these positions, combined with hires under Schedule A, should be the review and editing of the agency's public-facing web pages and social media accounts to eliminate material that does not conform to the new administration's policies. The agency should accelerate the review of congressional notifications within LPA and publish all CNS and congressional reports. To ensure consistency and clarity of public messaging, LPA should gain direct authority over the communications staff scattered through USAID's various bureaus and offices. LPA should expand its public-facing efforts to include conservative allies that are active in global development and humanitarian aid work, 
including industry groups, non-profits, trade associations, foundations, and advocacy organizations, and correspondingly reduce the aid industrial complex's grip on USAID's corporate relationships. Office of General Counsel Along with the director of M-OAA, the General Counsel is one of the two or three most important positions at USAID and should be a priority for immediate appointments. Because proper legal interpretation of executive orders and internal USAID policy is crucial, the next conservative administration should recruit and appoint a commanding team of Schedule C attorneys in the Office of the General Counsel, OGC. Within weeks of inauguration, day, OGC should issue clear guidance on the eligibility of faith-based organizations for USAID funding. Office of Budget Resources and Management The Director of Budget Resources and Management should be a political appointee empowered as part of the Administrator's senior management team. BRM's highest priorities should be to prepare the report required by Section 653, a, according to the Administrator's guidance, institute a fast-track process for the submission of congressional notifications and identify already appropriated resources to reprogram immediately to fund the new administration's priorities. The next conservative administration should consider prioritizing the placing of young political appointees in BRM over LPA. Bureau for Democracy, Development, and Innovation A key outcome of the transformation of USAID undertaken during the Trump administration, the Bureau for Democracy, Development, and Innovation, DDI, is the home for most of the agency's non-health, non-humanitarian funding as well as almost all of its sectoral appropriations directives including those that reflect the pet projects of individual members of Congress. The Bureau is the policy and financial nexus at USAID for most of the Biden administration's radical priorities in foreign assistance, including gender, climate change, and the promotion of identity-based politics. On the positive side, DDI is also the Bureau in charge of areas that will be crucial to a reorientation of USAID, including trade, economic growth, innovation, partnerships with the private sector, and the agency's relationship with communities of faith. The next conservative administration should make the rapid staffing of key DDI positions a high priority. Besides the Senate-confirmed assistant administrator, the directors of each of the centers and hubs in the Bureau will need political leadership. Almost every one of the agency-wide policies that cover DDI's areas of responsibility will need to be edited or rewritten entirely as soon as possible. The next conservative administration should harvest DDI's central appropriations to fund new priorities, especially working with ethnic and religious minorities and faith-based organizations and joint ventures with the private sector in education and energy. All DDI programs should issue funding opportunities restricted to new and underutilized partners modeled on the NPI. Regions Asia Asia is the most populous continent and ground zero in the battle against communist China's efforts to exploit the development needs of poor countries for geopolitical gain. America's Indo-Pacific strategy should guide USAID's approaches to dispersing foreign aid in the region. USAID should intensify its bilateral relationships with pro-free market Japan, Australia, South Korea, and India so that they can jointly advance private sector solutions to secure financing for power generation, infrastructure, digital connectivity, investment and trade expansion, and other economic activities. USAID enjoys a strong in-country presence in India, buttressed by recent coordination on the global response to COVID-19 as India is a global leader in vaccine production. Those ties should be expanded. So too should development cooperation with Taiwan which boasts effective pandemic response capacity that should be shared with developing countries. China's island-hopping efforts to capture vulnerable Pacific states is a direct strategic threat to U.S. maritime supremacy and homeland security, and USAID and its allied donors should neutralize these efforts through the deployment of targeted assistance such as helping countries combat the effects of China's illegal fishing. While China outpaces the ability of the Democratic Alliance to deploy state-backed financing to developing countries, it is unable to compete with our collective private sector capacity to deploy trillions of dollars of capital. Pakistan is a prime example of foreign aid policies disconnected from U.S. national interests. The country has been the recipient of more than $12 billion in U.S. foreign aid since 2010, yet it remains intensely anti-American and corrupt, has backed the Taliban continuously since 2001, jump-started North Korea's nuclear bomb program, brutalizes its religious minorities, and is a willing client of China while taking on unrepayable loans from the U.S. taxpayer-funded International Monetary Fund and World Bank. Middle East the Middle East is far more vulnerable today than it was in 2020 because the Biden administration's strategy for the region is adrift. Tunisia has slid into autocracy, Iraq is plummeting further into Iran's orbit, and U.S. soldiers continue to risk their lives for unclear ends amid the ruins of Syria. Meanwhile, billions of dollars in U.S. foreign aid props up regimes allied with Iran. President Trump's Abraham Accords signaled the end of the centrality of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which paralyzed U.S. approaches to the region, and focused instead on Iran as the principal threat to America from this region. During the Trump administration, USAID's allocations reflected the new opportunities created by the accords and sought to strengthen regional alliances against Iran through expanded regional trade and investment and to promote genuine political 
stability tethered to strong American leadership. USAID formally partnered with the United Arab Emirates, Israel, Morocco, Qatar, and Kuwait to catalyze regional partnerships in Africa. Under the Biden administration, however, USAID has returned to a model that deepens the region's dependence on aid. A new conservative president should reset USAID's programming in the Middle East in line with our national security interests and committed to the goal of ending the need for foreign aid through development that is led by the private sector. Specifically, L foreign aid must advance the Abraham Accords. Increased trade and investment between Israel and its Arab neighbors represent the most effective path toward reducing poverty, fostering the emergence of a middle class, and solidifying peace. USAID should therefore focus its development assistance on countries such as Morocco and Sudan through joint investment collaboration with the more economically advanced economies such as the UAE and Israel. LUSAID should consider cutting aid to states allied to Iran, limiting assistance in these countries to the advancement of narrow strategic priorities and support for basic American values, such as aid to persecuted religious minorities. USAID continues to expend hundreds of millions of dollars in non-humanitarian aid to antagonistic regimes in Iraq, Lebanon, and the Palestinian territories. After billions of dollars of aid and many years of effort, these countries remain hopelessly dysfunctional a fact that exposes the failure of a foreign aid model that is disconnected to our national security and without exit strategies to promote self-reliance. We must admit that USAID's investments in the education sector, for example, serve no other purpose than to subsidize corrupt, incompetent, and hostile regimes. LUSAID should undergo operational changes to secure better development outcomes by reducing its mission's footprints in the Middle East given that most personnel in the region are unable to leave their highly protected and expensive compounds and carry out their oversight functions. It should redirect program funding away from expensive and poorly performing international partners to more cost-effective local entities that require a minimal USAID field presence. Africa Since its inception, USAID has had a strong presence in Africa, saving millions of lives through its pandemic and infectious disease responses especially for malaria and HIV-AIDS. It has led global efforts to provide life-saving emergency assistance to those who are fleeing conflict and suffering from devastating natural disasters. American generosity knows no equal. Yet the agency's efforts to reduce poverty and hunger have failed as it spends ever higher amounts of aid partnering with a costly and ineffective aid industrial complex that has little interest in working itself out of a job. Long-term, multi-billion dollar humanitarian responses lack exit strategies, while numerous Development projects lead neither to measurable results nor to government reforms. Despite the tens of billions of dollars spent, the continent remains poor, unstable, and riven with conflict, corruption, and Islamic terrorism. This situation has also resulted in vast illegal migration from the continent. Failure to generate wealth has provided opportunities for China to step in and become the continent's leader in trade, loans, and investment. As a result, Beijing controls most of the continent's strategic minerals that are critical to advanced technology. Moreover, USAID is criticized by Africans for exporting cultural values that are anathema to their traditional norms, further abetting Chinese continental supremacy. The Biden administration's radical global climate policies have cut off billions in investment to develop clean fossil fuels, denying Africa's billion-plus people access to cheap energy to further their own development and finance their own social services in health, water, education, and agriculture, while increasing its dependence on China's renewables industry. It has exacerbated hunger by increasing the costs of fertilizers to levels that many African farmers can no longer afford. Poverty-inducing dependence on aid grows daily. USAID efforts in Africa require a rethink. In 2025, USAID will update its five-year country development and cooperation strategies. This will give the next administration an opportunity to pursue a new development course for Africa that promotes economic self-reliance, catalyzes private sector solutions for job creation through increased trade and investment, terminates legacy and non-performing programs, and supports diversified energy approaches. Critically, it must hold China accountable for its extractive investments that violate international labor, environmental, and anti-corruption norms and practices, undercut business opportunities for U.S. companies, and sabotage Africa's development. LUSAID, in collaboration with the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, U.S. Department of State, U.S. Department of the Treasury, and U.S. Department of Commerce's Foreign Commercial Service, should use its convening power, diplomatic heft, and risk-reducing instruments to facilitate U.S.-African business relationships and expand Prosper Africa, launched by the Trump administration to bring together services from across the U.S. government to help companies and investors do business in U.S. and African markets. 17. L. The Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, 18 provides Africa duty-free access to U.S. markets. The next administration should extend AGOA beyond its 2025 term but within a strategic framework that rewards good governance and pro-free market economic policies. There is no point in wasting massive sums of aid to countries whose governments fail to keep their promises to reform. LUSAID should build on, not compete with, 
private sector initiatives launched by global churches, corporate philanthropists and diaspora groups that have already invested billions of dollars in self-reliance-based projects. Japan has committed $30 billion in aid to Africa over three years to stem China's economic and political grip on the continent. Gulf-based sovereign funds also are investing billions in African energy, infrastructure, mining, water, food production, information and communications technology, and other strategic industries. Other allied donors are promoting investment-based aid. There is no lack of funding to support Africa's economic rise. What is lacking is strategic direction among U.S. government foreign aid agencies. PEPFAR has saved countless lives over the years and constitutes America's most successful aid program. During the Trump administration, PEPFAR increased the share of funding to local entities from about 20% to nearly 70% with commensurate improvements that have had lasting impact. The next administration should extend that localization model to all global health and humanitarian assistance in view of how local African entities have strengthened their capacity for direct management of U.S. programs. Correspondingly, USAID should aggressively ramp down its partnerships with wasteful, costly and politicized UN agencies, international NGOs, and Beltway contractors. All new programs in Africa should build on existing local initiatives that enjoy the support of the African people. Latin America U.S. foreign assistance throughout the Western Hemisphere is designed to respond to national security threats that emanate from the region, such as illicit drug and arms trafficking, illegal immigration flows, terrorism, pandemics, and strategic threats from China, Russia, and Iran. Over the past decade, the United States has provided billions of dollars in security, humanitarian, and development assistance in Central America and the Andes, including $1 billion in food and non-food emergency aid to millions of Venezuelan refugees who have fled the Maduro dictatorship. USAID is always first to respond to natural disasters in Central America and the Caribbean and employs a network of dedicated experts in the region to deliver this assistance. During the COVID pandemic, the United States provided millions of doses of vaccines and other emergency health support. Yet years of foreign aid have failed to bring peace, prosperity and stability to the hemisphere. Poverty, joblessness and social unrest have led to leftist electoral victories from Mexico to Chile. These regimes are hostile to American interests and private enterprise, breed corruption, implement radical policies that will further impoverish their people and threaten their democracies, and are more open to striking partnerships with communist China. Left-wing authoritarian kleptocracies In Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela deny their people basic freedoms, violently and ruthlessly suppress any dissent, repress communities of faith, and generate such misery that hundreds of thousands of their citizens have attempted to cross our southern border over the past two years. No recent administration has made any progress in reducing the chaos and desperation in Haiti. Conversely, Latin America is a major global source of energy and food, which generates substantial income that can finance internal social and economic development. The nations of the hemisphere share a natural and massive geographic trade and investment advantage through their proximity to the United States, supplemented by free trade agreements. The United States remains the favored destination for higher education and business opportunities for Latin Americans. Successful diasporas in the United States serve as powerful economic, cultural and political bridges to every country in the region. The Trump administration focused on promoting trade and investment, especially in infrastructure, through an interagency effort called America Cress, America Grows, by which USAID played a key role in providing technical assistance to create a more enabling environment to attract private investment. The Biden administration cancelled the program. The next conservative administration should reassess all programs of U.S. foreign aid to Latin America and terminate those that have failed to achieve results after years of effort. Instead, USAID should L. Focus its resources on strengthening the fundamentals of free markets, such as clear property rights and a functioning judiciary, and on promoting labor and pension reforms, lower taxes and deregulation in order to increase trade and investment within the region and with the United States as the genuine path to economic and political stability. L. Challenge the socialist ideas that have captured too many of the region's governments and their nation's youth. L. Fund partnerships with the private sector and support civil society groups, including university centers and think tanks that advocate for pro-free market and democratic ideas. Finally. Latin America is the perfect proving ground for reducing USAID's reliance on large U.S.-based implementers, and the agency should commit to shifting all of its portfolio in the region to local organizations by 2030. Personnel The Trump administration agenda for USAID was undercut from the outset both by recalcitrant career personnel and by inexperienced political personnel. The next conservative administration should implement personnel policies from the beginning so that the agency can be effectively managed according to high standards. The rapid deployment of reforms will require key experienced personnel installed quickly at USAID's headquarters and missions. Delay will only impede progress. In general, areas of focus should be appointing effective lawyers in key positions, reforming career hiring slash firing mechanisms, and getting a grip on the grant making process. The administration should staff the office of the general counsel with at least four politically appointed attorneys, 
besides the General Council. The General Council should have two political deputies, one of whom should cover Human Capital and Talent Management, HCTM, and the other the Office of Acquisition and Assistance, OAA. The administration should name a political appointee with long experience in federal personnel systems as USAID's Chief Human Capital Officer and Director of HCTM. This appointee would help to scope and shepherd position descriptions, clearances, and other components of the hiring process that are necessary for immediate onboarding while coordinating with the White House to bring in new appointees and make internal career employee changes. On day one, USAID should halt all agency-wide training and replace it with training modules to advance the president's agenda. The administration should appoint a senior accountable official, SAO, to report on the agency's adherence to administration policy priorities, including on protecting life and foreign assistance, critical race theory, climate change, gender, and diversity and inclusion. It should also create a program to staff hard to fill positions overseas. Finally, the administration should create a recruiting program for veterans and other groups to participate in career job opportunities at USAID. Former missionaries, veterans, members of diasporas, and faith community stakeholders with overseas experience should be recruited to work at USAID on Schedule A appointments. As institutional services contractors, as personal services contractors, and as foreign service officers. Conclusion the next conservative administration will have a unique opportunity to realign U.S. foreign assistance with American national interests and the principles of good governance and more accurately reflect the U.S. taxpayers' unmatched charitable desire to help those in need. It can build on a strong baseline of conservative reforms undertaken by the Trump administration to counter communist China's strategy of world domination. However, this will require that bold steps are taken on day one to undo the gross misuse of foreign aid by the current administration to promote a radical ideology that is politically divisive at home and harms our global standing. Authors note, the preparation of this chapter was a collective enterprise of individuals involved in the 2025 Presidential Transition Project. All contributors to this chapter are listed at the front of this volume, but Dr. William Steiger, Bethany Kozma, and Dr. Alma Golden deserve special mention. The author assumes full responsibility for the content of this chapter, and no views expressed therein should be attributed to any other individual. End notes. 1S 1983, Foreign Assistance Act of 1961, Public Law No. 87-195, 87th Congress, September 4, 1961, https www.govinfo.gov slash content slash package slash statute 75 slash PDF slash statute 75 PG 424 2. PDF, accessed January 19, 2023. To U.S. Agency or International Development, Journey to Self Reliance Fact Sheet, June 3, 2020. HTTPS slash slash 2017 2020 dot USAID dot gov slash documents slash 1870 slash journey self reliance fact sheet number colon text equals what percent 20 is percent 20 the percent 20 journey percent 20 to percent 20 self reliance percent 3f percent 20 USAID percent 20 is greater percent 20 development outcomes and work toward a time when foreign assistance see no longer necessary percent 20 it percent e2 percent 80 percent 99s percent 20 called percent 20 the percent 20 journey percent 20 to percent 20 self reliance Accessed March 17, 2023. 3 News Release, U.S. Agency for International Development Administrator Mark Green's interview with C-SPAN's newsmakers host Susan Swain and Washington Post's Carl Morello and Wall Street Journal's Ben Kessling, U.S. Agency for International Development, November 26, 2018, https 2017